This is the Get Sellers Calling You Marketing Podcast for real estate agents, and I'm Beatty Carmichael. To learn how to generate more listings from past clients and sphere of influence, geographic farming, and commercial investment property, visit our website at GetSellersCallingYou.com. And now, let's begin our next session of Get Sellers Calling You. Hey, this is Beatty Carmichael, and before I introduce this podcast session, I need to make a quick correction for you. On a previous uh, podcast episode and on this one, you'll hear me using the wrong word. I use a word that I call antimony to describe two truths that are uh, appear to be in contradiction to each other. I use the wrong word. Antimony is a chemical. The word I meant to use is antinomy. So when you hear that on this podcast session and then you hear the word antimony, just mentally replace it with antinomy and everything will be cool. Thanks, and here's the podcast. Welcome, everyone. So glad you've joined us again. Um, My name is Penny. I know you're all familiar with my voice, but for those of you who are not, I'm glad you're joining us. I'm joined again with my great friend, Beatty Carmichael. Um, We are here to do this next session of Get Sellers Calling You. Beatty is the CEO of Master Grabber, the creator of Agent Dominator, and one of the top marketing experts in the real estate field. Beatty, I'm super excited about today. What do you have for our listeners? Uh, I'm super excited as well, Penny. We are going to do another, what we call a radical faith call. For those who are just joining in on our podcast, this is our podcast, if you're on the Get Sellers Calling You channel, because we have kind of two channels, um, but on the Get Sellers Calling You, we alternate a real estate marketing with radical faith, and radical faith is all about Christian teaching, um, how to live as a Christian. So today is the radical faith portion, so if you don't have any interest in Christian topics, uh, you can just skip this episode and come back to the next one, but if you do have interest, I encourage you to listen in. So, awesome. Um, Yeah, and today we're wrapping up a really big topic we've been talking on. Uh, It's the topic of salvation, and is salvation from man's free will or by God's choosing of Hmm. that man. And um, uh, it started, I was thinking it was going to be like maybe a three-session, three-episode session. This is now episode six, okay? (laughs) So it's been really, really big. Um, But hopefully, it's been really exciting. I know it's been exciting for me. And uh, today, we're going to kind of tie everything together because we've touched on a lot of different topics, but we left those topics kind of loose-ended. And now we've got like a tapestry with a bunch of strings, and what we want to do today is just tie all the strings together and and package it up, and it's going to kind of form that picture. But if you are just starting on this podcast, this is the first of these that you've heard. Let me encourage you, rather than listening to this podcast, because it's not going to make as much sense if you don't have all the backstory and all of the process that we've come through to this point, if you'll go mm-hmm. back on our podcast and start with the same topic, but start with episode one and start listening to them in sequence, uh, I think you'll get a lot out of it, a lot more out of yeah. it, because yeah. we're going to skip a lot of stuff that we talked on, that domain knowledge that you're not going to really understand. Uh, or buy into. So um, so with that, <clears throat> what I'd like to do real quickly, Penny, is for our listeners, kind of review what we've discussed thus far. And I'm going to okay. try to keep it really condensed, okay? Okay. Okay, so keep in mind this topic is man's free will versus ex- essentially God's free will, okay? Which one is the overriding uh, thing? And so the first thing we did is we had to understand what free will really is. Because we use terms uh, loosely, but God uses terms specifically. This is the key when we're interpreting the scripture. We can't simply use a different word than what God uses because they mean something. And so we looked at the definition of free will. By the way, free will or anything man's free will is never in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible. So the doctrine of free will is not a clear, specific, biblical doctrine, it's something that man has pieced together, okay? So we have to look at kind of what is free will. Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines free will as the ability to choose how to act and to make choices that are not controlled by fate or God. And as it relates to salvation, free will is essentially man's ability to choose 
to repent and believe in Jesus all of his own accord and without any involvement from the Lord in making it happen. Would you agree that that's kind of uh, probably the, the definition of what free will really is? Yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when we looked at this, we looked at the first session, we looked at a couple of things. We looked at what is man's nature, okay? Um, and looking at a lot of verses, <clears throat> you first said man's nature is he, he's normally good. I said, well, let's look, look and see what God says about man. And everything we found that from God's perspective was evil. In fact, this is the summary that we put together. From God's perspective, which is the only perspective that's, that matters, he's, it says that man's nature is inherently evil. Uh, he is evil continuously. He's unclean and unable to be clean of and on his own. His heart is deceitful, full of wickedness. He has no good, seeks no good, does not seek after God, is worthless and does no good. He is evil in mind and body, and his mind cannot understand or accept any of God's truths. All of those are excerpts from all of the passages we looked at. These are God's words to us. And so if man's nature is inherently evil, he cannot have the free will to change his nature and become good or even pursue good because of his own, he cannot act, out, act outside of his nature. One of the things we discussed and we asked is, God cannot sin, and he cannot sin because it's not his nature. Man cannot choose good because it's not his nature. Okay, so that's kind of where the nature, uh, man's nature comes in. But then we also looked at slavery. And Jesus tells us in John 8 that everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So we find that we were in sin before we repented and became in, uh, before we repented and believed, right? Mm-hmm. And when we're enslaved to sin, we no longer have a free will because free will, by definition, is free. But if we're a slave, we don't have free will. We can make choices within the confines of our master. The other thing we found out and looked at with slavery is the slave does not have the free will to change masters. If a slave changes masters, it's because one master created the change and the slave simply had to go along. So uh, Mm -hmm. back in the olden days of slavery, or even modern days, a slave exchanges masters either because one master purchases it or one master conquers the other master. We We used to be slaves of sin. We're now slaves of Christ. So something happened to change our master, but we know by the element of slavery, it could not have been us. Therefore, it could not have been our free will. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So then the next session we looked at is we started to look at passages about choosing. So the idea of free will is that man chooses to repent and follow God. In other words, man chooses Christ. But yet, there's nowhere in the Bible where it says that man chooses God. But throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelations, it's constantly talking about God choosing man. So we started to look at some of those passages and what they say. And and, uh, in Jesus, in Matthew 11, he says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And then he makes a really interesting statement. He says, No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. So we see that for anyone to even know the Father, the Son must first choose to reveal the Father to that person. It's not simply of a free will. Then we also look in John 15, and Jesus makes another statement. He says, he's talking to His disciples. He says, you did not choose Me. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Now, if we go back and tie into one of the other episodes we talked about, which is, do all who accept Christ go to heaven? The first episode, we talked about the parable of the seed and the sower. And uh, and the, the defining element in what Jesus says is my disciple or not is the ability of one to produce fruit or the seed that produces fruit. In that topic, we discussed and came to the conclusion that fruit, 
is Christ being formed in you. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus says, I chose you and appointed you that you should bear fruit, what we can then kind of transliterate that based on these other scriptures is that what Christ is really saying is, I chose you that I would be formed in you and that I would produce fruit through you. In mm -hmm. other words, all of the action is Jesus. None of the action is man. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then, if therefore, if God is the one choosing man, then it's not man's free will choosing God. Then we see this even more clearly in our third episode. We're talking about in Christ. So in Ephesians 1, it says that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And we started talking about the lineage. We talked about the passage, I think it's Galatians, that says Levi paid tithes because he was in Abraham's loins when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Do you remember that? I do, a little bit, yes. Okay. okay. And so basically what this is saying is there is a lineage, there is an ancestry, that because Levi is of the direct lineage of Abraham, then Levi was considered to be in Abraham. Okay, That's basically the concept that we're talking about. And so here in Ephesians, God is saying that he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. In other words, we are of Christ's spiritual lineage. There is a direct lineage between Christ and us. We are in Christ. Essentially, it's kind of what that's saying. And, mm -hmm. But the most important part of this is because Levi was in Abraham's loins, eventually Ab Levi was born as a descendant of Abraham. And because we are in Christ, we were already chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Then that means that, that Christ is our ancestry and our lineage is that we would be, quote unquote, born. Okay? Uh, and that happened, that sh choosing of being in Christ was long before we ever repented and believed. Then we looked at another session in session four. We looked at sheep. And every time the metaphor of sheep is used, it's representing not only God's chosen people, but God's people who receive eternal life. Back in Isaiah, it says, All we have sheep have, have gone astray, and the Lord has placed our iniquity on the Messiah. Okay, So when our iniquity is placed on the Messiah, that means we no longer uh, uh, carry the, the, um, uh, the punishment of that iniquity, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that means that when our iniquity is placed on the Messiah, that's when we now have salvation, now are justified. So we see in that the metaphor of sheep representing those who are justified through the action of the Messiah. And then we see uh, uh, Jesus talking about the lost sheep. You remember the parable of the lost sheep? A shepherd loses a sheep. He leaves the 99. Yes. He goes searches. And goes after the one. Yes. Goes after the one. <laughs> puts them on his shoulder and everyone rejoices, right? Yes. Who does the lost sheep represent? Um, a non-believer. It, it represents a non-believer who repents and believes. It's not just non-believers. It, it's the one who is found. The lost sheep is always found, okay? Mm -hmm. And when he is found, that's designating he's repented and believed, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You're right. Was the sheep, did the sheep already belong to the shepherd before it was lost? Yes. Yeah. So the sheep was already, if, so we know the shepherd is Jesus and the sheep is us. We were already Jesus's before we were lost. Mm -hmm. But we're lost in sin, which started at birth, right? Because we're born in sin. That's right. 
Okay, so what this means is we were already his before we were born, which goes back to we were already in Christ before the foundation of the world. But then let's look at this uh, lost sheep one a little bit closer. Does the sheep by his own free will find the shepherd and rejoin the flock? Or is it an act of the shepherd that finds the lost sheep? Uh, it's an act of the shepherd. He goes ah. after the sheep. He goes after the sheep. So is there any free will of the sheep involved? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So free will doesn't exist there either. And then last session, we talked about the concept of mine versus not mine from God's perspective. Those who are gods, those who are not gods. Mm-hmm. And we make a – Jesus makes a really clear distinction. This is in John 8. He makes a really clear distinction between two groups of people. Just as there's a distinction between the sheep and the goats, remember back to the sheep, you know, he puts the sheep on his right, they go to eternal heaven, he puts the goats on his left, and they go to destruction. So we see this concept and this pattern of separate groups of people. Okay? Uh, we see it with Israel, we see it with everyone. So Jesus makes this distinction that there's two groups of people, one who cannot come to him and the other who will come to him and follow him. Okay, So this is uh, in John 8, and I'm just going to uh, uh, read what we discussed last time. Jesus is talking, and he said to them, I'm going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. He's talking to some Pharisees at this time, or some Jews. And what's mm-hmm. interesting is the word you cannot. Jesus is, is, isn't saying, I know that you will not repent and believe, and therefore where I'm going, you won't come. Jesus makes the statement, you cannot come, and the Greek word means no, never, not at all, nothing. Okay, It is an impossibility. So Jesus is saying, it is impossible for you to come where I'm going. And he continues, he said, if God were your father, you would love me. So now he's saying that God is not your father. And it's not that God is not your father now, but he's going to be your father later. Let's, he says, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God. He said, you cannot, there's that word again, you cannot bear to hear my word because you are of your father the devil. So now he makes okay. a clear distinction. You are of the devil. You cannot hear my word. And then immediately after that he says, whoever is of God hears the words of God. For you to hear the words of God, must you already be of God? Yes. Okay, so now he is saying, your origin is determining whether you get to hear my words or not. You, the Jews, your origin was your father, the devil. You cannot hear my words. Only those who are of God can even hear the words of God. And the reason you do not hear them, he says, is because you are not of God. So we see this pattern where Jesus is making a very clear distinction. There are two groups of people, those of God and those not of God. And he says that only those who are of God can even hear my words. Are you following where I'm going? This, is this bringing back yes. the remembrance? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So then we look at this distinction even further, and we see it becomes clearer. Where does faith come from? Do you remember um, what we talked about a long time ago, but it's Romans ten seventeen. Um, faith, who does faith come from? Where? Faith comes oh, where? from? A hearing. And hearing what? Hearing the word. What word? The word of God. Ah, Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. But only those of God can hear the word of God, which is what Jesus says. Do you see the problem? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So only those of God can even hear the word of God to have faith. Must you have faith to repent and believe in Jesus? Yes. But you can't have that faith unless you can hear the word of God, right? Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you can't hear the word, and you cannot hear the word of God unless you are already of God. That's what Jesus clearly says. 
Uh This creates that conundrum again, doesn't it? That's right, it does. And so while man is responsible to repent and believe, in some mysterious way, his faith to repent and believe is determined by God and not by man's free will. Follow Mm -hmm. me on that? Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. So then we have more of the conundrum, and I want to address it. One of the things we talked about a while back is the concept of antimony, okay? And um, this is, uh, I want to give credit back to J.I. Packer on, on this little section I want to discuss because I think it, it clearly shows you where this conundrum and this thinking of, well, maybe there's got to be a free will because this just doesn't make sense, okay? So antimony is where you have two truths that appear to contradict each other but they actually peacefully coexist with each other. What has to happen is you have to get your eyes off of man's logic and actually look and see what God's Word says. So I want you to um, turn real quickly to John 6, verse 38 through 40. Okay. Let's see. John 6, 38 through 40 says... For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. Okay, so here are two really cool truths. Truth number one, Jesus says, all that he has given me. Okay? So this is Christ's saving mission defined in terms of those whom the Father has chosen to give him. And he says, of them I lose not one. In other words, 100% of every person the Father has given me, I will take to heaven with me. Do you see that? Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, But then, look, in the very same passage, we have another truth. Everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And I will raise Him up on the last day. This is Christ's saving mission defined in terms of all of mankind to Mm -hmm. whom He offers Himself and the promise without distinction that if they will repent and believe, he will certainly save them. Mm-hmm. Okay? So we have two truths. Those that God gives me, 100% go. And the other truth, all, I, anyone who repents and believes, I will save. So then we, here's a question. For the statement to be, anyone who repents and believes, I will save, does that require that everyone have the ability to repent and believe for it to be true. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. Are we going to explore that? <laughs> well, so we actually we actually talked about it last time. Mine versus not mine. Then okay? yes. Yeah, the answer would be yes. They have to have the ability for that statement to be true. Yes. So when Jesus says, where I'm going, you cannot come, no way possible, do they have the ability to repent and believe? Not the opportunity, but the ability. Hmm. Let me let's go back to let's go back to the little <laughs> theology. This will make sense, okay? So we okay. talked about a rich dad, poor dad theology last time. Mm-hmm. In real net, uh, narrow uh, sense, rich dad has children; they're they taken away at birth. Rich dad is the king, owns the kingdom. Later uh-huh. in life, he wants to find his children to give his inheritance to. So he sends out his servants with a proclamation, whoever passes the DNA test will inherit the kingdom of the king. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Is that proclamation true for everyone in the kingdom? No. Well, it's true, yes. It's yeah, true okay, for everyone there you in the kingdom. Yeah. It's true, but is everyone in the kingdom have the ability to pass it? No. Who can pass it? Only those that are that have his DNA. Ah. Only those who are in Christ 
before the foundation of the world are therefore of God and therefore can hear the words of God and therefore the statement that Christ makes, whoever repents and believes I will save is true, but the other statement, only those whom the Father has chosen and given to me will actually be the ones with the ability to repent and believe. Do you see how this, these are two truths, they're both completely true. They appear to be in contradiction, but they're really not. Mm -hmm. You're still not buying yeah. into it. You're, it's, still, I, I, <laughs> it's tough, right? Okay. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Um, it's changing one's perspective. And that's the hardest thing. So what I want to do real quickly is I want to touch now that we've gone through all of this, I want to touch on predestination. Because I know for most people, a lot of people, this is a dirty word. Predestination, because it creates so much conflict. And notice this entire uh, uh, topic, I've never used the word predestination. We've never focused on any of the verses on predestination. But everything seems to point in that direction. So now what I want to do is I want to talk about predestination. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. So <laughs> let, me, let, let me state what most people uh, think of when they think of predestination. They say, there's no way a loving God would predestine someone to hell. That just doesn't seem right. Is that what most people say? Yes. I would agree with that. All right. So here's the problem. They take the scripture out of context and then they apply a meaning that God doesn't give us. This is the problem that I see so much is we put man's perspective and not God's perspective. In every instance where the word predestined is used or even the word of choosing or election, it's always focused on those whom God has chosen to receive his kingdom. Let me ask you a question. When the rich man puts out the proclamation, whoever passes the DNA test will receive an inheritance in my kingdom. Are certain people predestined to be able to pass that test? Uh, yes, his children. Okay. Does that mean that the king has predestined poverty upon everyone else? Uh, no. You put it that way, that sounds mean, but yes. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it, it, no. It, the king done predestined them because the king didn't birth them and then assign them there. The king can give his inheritance to his descendants, but he's not obligated to give his inheritance to his non-descendants. Mm -hmm. But what happens is we start to twist it and say, well, you're giving it to some people. That means you are purposely sending those other people to hell. No. God says, the wages of sin is death. Period. So it's, a, you know, it's, um, so it's not a predestination. But with that, what I want to do is um, I want to look at two verses there's only a few verses okay. that mention predestination. I just want to show this to you in Scripture. Go to Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5. And we'll do all these still in ESV, as we always say. Ephesians 1, verse 4 and 5 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he pre predestined us for adoption to himself, as sons through Christ Jesus, according to the purpose of his will. Okay. So here we see again, he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. And because we were chosen before the foundation of the world, that means he has predestined us for that adoption. Okay. So that's, where, that's what predestined is talking about, because he's already chosen us. By the way, would you deny the fact that God has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world? No. And by not denying it, you, by consequence, you affirm predestination. Mm 
because that's really all it is. Do you see how this works? Sort of. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, think my, are, I think my brain has been trained to think a certain way. So then that's course, right. Even if something, even if something makes sense, it goes in contradiction to what I've always thought or that's felt it. To that's be right. True. Right. And so what we have to do is we have to wash our brain of man's wisdom and logic and renew our mind in God's truths. Okay? Uh, let me see if this makes sense real quickly. You don't have grandchildren yet, but when you have grandchildren, are they predestined to be of your lineage and to receive of your inheritance ultimately? Yes. They're in you. They're predestined simply because they're in you. It's not that you mm -hmm. purposely said, I'm going to give Sue my stuff and John next door I'm not because I don't like John. It's simply because they're your descendants. Let's look at the mm -hmm. next passage, Romans 8:28 through 30. Okay. All right, Romans 8, verse 28 through 30 says... And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Okay, wow, so this is all kinds of things that are really difficult. Predestined, mm -hmm. called, all these things. Let me ask you, based on what we've been talking about, does this start to make more sense, maybe, than it did before we started the series? A little bit, yes. A little bit, okay. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to have you look at the sequence of what Paul's talking about. Uh, and primarily, I think this is verse 30. Um, but I want to compare it to what we've been talking about and see if now we can add some elimination to it. So it says, those he predestined, he also called. Okay. In other words, those whom he chose to be in Christ before the foundation of the world and were therefore already his sheep before they got lost, right? Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Those are the ones that are his sheep, and his sheep follow him. Does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. Jesus says that he calls his sheep by name, which means that he already knows us. And it says that the sheep, his sheep, hear his voice and will follow him. You remember that? Yes. Okay. They follow him because they are already his. And what is the first step for us to follow Jesus? Uh, believing that there is a Jesus. <laughs> right. Believing him. So let me, let, me, let me make it more technically, scripturally accurate. Repent and believe. Would you agree with that? Is that okay? Yes. yes. Okay, so that's the first step. That's how, you, that's how you become a baby Christian. You repent and believe, okay? And what mm -hmm. happens... Spiritually, when we repent and believe? Um, our spirit man is mm -hmm. raised with Christ. Okay. All right. So um, uh, our spirit man is raised with Christ, but there's a, there's a technical word, a legal word I'm looking for, of what actually happens in relation to our sins. We're forgiven of sins completely. Yeah, we're justified Past, of our present, sins, right? Past, future, yeah, justified. We're justified, okay? So the technical word is justified. When we repent and believe, we then become justified just as if I had never sinned because those sins are now transferred to Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so now look at this verse. Those whom he predestined, because they were in Christ, they were his sheep, he called. When he calls, Jesus says, they will follow him, which means repent and believe. And then look at the next section. Repenting and believe means those whom he called, he also justified. Why does he justify them? Because when he calls them, they do respond 
by repenting and believing. Mm -hmm. Is that making sense? Do you see that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is what Jesus says, none that you've given me do I lose. Notice also it doesn't say some whom he called he also justified. It says those whom he called. In other words, if Jesus calls you, you will be justified because you will repent and believe because you were his sheep, because you were in him, because you were predestined, because you were already in him. Do you see kind of this this train connecting yes, it all together? I do. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, uh, then, um, uh, uh, then after justification, you have those whom he justified. He also glorified. Glorified is uh, occurs when we receive our resurrected body, and we our body is now glorified in the image of Christ. Okay. So we see this entire pattern. We're chosen in Christ, which means we've then been predestined for our destiny. Then he calls us, and because we're already his, we hear his voice and respond. And because we respond, he justifies. And because we're justified, he glorifies. Okay? Mm-hmm. Now, let's look at another thing that's always difficult. It ties back to, well, surely God doesn't send people to hell if he could send them to heaven. Okay, and that mm-hmm. general concept. Why would God do that? Okay, so let's look at Romans nine, nineteen through twenty-four. Do this in the NIV version. Romans nine nineteen okay. through twenty-four, and this is the Potter and the clay. So this is Paul writing under the uh, direction of the Holy Spirit, telling us this very same issue that we're struggling with. Okay, twenty through twenty-four. 19 through 24. Oh, 19 through 24. Okay. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? Pause for a moment. But, so why does God okay. still blame us? I mean, he's got the ability to make us more perfect, to justify us. So why does he blame us for our sins? Okay. that's what, hmm. So keep going. But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. Okay, so basically, just in brief summary, you know, will one of you say, why does God still blame us? Paul says, does not the potter, talking about God, have the right to make two groups of vessels out of the same material? One for holy use, and one that will end up in destruction. Doesn't the potter have the right to do whatever he wants to do? That's basically what this is saying. So does this indicate that maybe God formed some people for destruction and others for blessing? Hmm. Possibly. You don't want to believe what it is. You don't want to accept that, but read this back. (laughs) So first off, let's claim... when. When he says, why does God still blame us, and who are you to question God, does not the potter? So can we make the connection that the potter is now a metaphor referencing God? Yes. Okay. So does this say that God has the right and uses that right to make some, uh, look at the very end, some that he prepares for glory and some that he prepares for destruction? And the vessels we know represent people. Does the potter create some vessels that are going to be used for destruction? Yes. Does the potter create some vessels that are used for glory? Yes. Does the potter choose which vessels are which? Yes. Is the potter representing God? Yes. 
Yes. Do the vessels represent men? Yes. And because of that, the implication of what this is saying is really tough to handle. But rather than trying to really dig into this further right now, what I'd like to do is let's wrap up today. And then on the next and final session, I'll come back and we'll look at this with some other things. And I think it'll make it'll all make more sense. Is that all right? Yeah. More to come for you, those listeners. And by the way, if you like this, if you haven't subscribed to our podcast, please do so. So you get more of these. And, and I'd like to challenge everyone on this to go and ask yourself, why do I believe this certain way? And find the scriptures, not one scripture, but the pattern of scriptures that all point to why you should believe that way. Make sure that what we're believing, and this is, I, I think I mentioned this, this is, maybe not, this is how I started in this whole process. I started to experience things that my church not taught. And then I question, how much of what I believe that I've been taught to believe is really the truth? So then I started to dig into Scripture and say, what does the Scripture say? No longer satisfied to believe what I've been taught simply because I've been taught it. I want mm -hmm. foundational proof from God's Word alone. And that's why I keep wanting to reference back, find some Scripture, show me what we're talking about, and let's look at it. Because from there, we can kind of see what it is. Well, it definitely brings up a lot of questions, and I would just want to conclude by encouraging those who are listening to do just like what Baby said, just um, go to the Word, and read the Word, and, and pray and ask the Lord. Ask the Lord what it is that He wants you to hear from that Word and, and listen to Him and let Him tell you. Baby, thank you so much for um, yet again another great session, and thank you for the time and effort you put into this. Um, and we're out of time for today, but we look forward to meeting with you all again very soon. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it so you never miss another episode. Also, if you want an easy way to grow your business, check out Agent Dominator. We guarantee listings and sales from past clients in sphere of influence, geographic farming, and commercial investment properties. If you don't get the sales, we promise we'll give your money back. Learn more on our website at GetSellersCallingYou.com and select Agent Dominator from the menu. Thanks for listening to the Get Sellers Calling You podcast and have a great day.